This is Kuben Cassius for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Delighted to be joined by Mr. Dan Raphael himself. How are you keeping, Dan? We're going to keep it all right. One of those things. Uh, we're all hunkered down and uh, the world's a different place right now, but we'll all get through it. We'll come on to that in a little while. But yeah, some, some quite big news that kind of emerged this week regarding yourself, Dan. Uh, parting ways with ESPN, which come to everyone's surprise and it was a bit of a shock so could you kind of just talk me through the circumstances which led to this then well uh you know first of all it was a good great 15 year run you know i did look i did five years at usa today which at the time was the largest newspaper in the united states uh went from there to espn uh the biggest sports outlet in the united states one of the biggest in the whole world and uh you know had a great 15 year run all on boxing couldn't have been uh couldn't have been better uh you know but when uh you're at a big company like that and certain things are changed at the top and new people come in and they have different ideas about how they want things to go and how things to run. And they take a look at their personnel and you have an expiring contract and uh, they tell you that, you know, you're making more money than everybody else, to be quite honest. And uh, then you, you, even if there's a chance to salvage it at that point, and then you throw in a global pandemic and a company that's reeling because no sports are being televised or played, uh, you know, it's, it's, it becomes a perfect storm. And, uh, you know, I was part of that. And so my contract expired and they did not renew. And, uh, here I am, uh, still very much alive, still very excited about the sport of boxing. Can't wait to get it back, uh, you know, in arenas and back on our TV screens and streaming services and all that. And, uh, hope to be back ringside for somebody at some point. Was there uh, an opportunity for you to still be involved with ESPN in a lesser capacity then? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, we never got to that point. I don't think so. Um, you know, it, it, it didn't, it didn't move in that direction. Um, you know, it was pretty clear they wanted to do something different. Uh, it's their prerogative. Um, you know, I thanked them for 15 years and, uh, you know, at, I said this to somebody else uh, in, a, in an interview I did. It's kind of like a boxer, you know, you may have a great career, but sometimes the way things come to an end are not exactly how you want it, but that doesn't erase all the good things that happened before that. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at this, uh, the way an Anthony Joshua did when he lost uh, uh, Andy Ruiz or how Lennox looked at it when he got beat by Hasim Rockman or any number of great champions uh, that lost their, their fights. You know, you get knocked down, you get back up, and uh, you give it another go, and that's what I plan on doing. Has this situation um, come about with you, Dan, uh, solely because of the situation we're in re regarding coronavirus? Uh, no, I don't think that's the case at all. I, I don't think that it helped. I'll put it like that. If there was any chance to work something out, obviously this probably killed those possibilities uh but to be honest i didn't i didn't get it i didn't get into that with them it, it seems like obviously you're probably the most kind of recognized media personality in the world of boxing not just in the u.s but i'm sure already you probably would have had other offers for other outlets whichever that may be i mean no real offers at this point and i'm not surprised by that to be honest first of all this has only become sort of a public thing in the last few days i mean i think it really people started to you know it it, it came out in the public uh i i first realized it was in the public probably very very late sunday night my united states time uh certainly monday it was all over the place uh you know i didn't really spend most of my monday uh on uh on, on the internet or on social media so you know i didn't realize how big of a thing it was to be honest but i have to tell you uh, during that day and into Tuesday and even up to now, oh, we're, we're talking here on, on oh, was it Thursday, I think? Yeah, <laughs> Thursday. I like to lose track of the days. Uh, but I have to say, though, and this has been amazing, uh, the way I've looked at it is the amount of people within the sport of boxing. First of all, fans on social media who don't know me but have read the work or watched me on television or listened to you know, these types of interviews and that sort of stuff have, have had some very negative things, which comes with the territory. But I have to say, by and large, it's been amazingly positive and, and uh, uplifting and very kind and nice and, uh, you know, heartening. Um, but the amount of people that do know me who I've worked with in various capacities through the years, you know, this is, I'm doing this 20 years now, Coogan, um, who have reached out in positive ways, either by emails, telephone calls, you know, Facebook messages, uh, direct messages on Twitter, um, text messages. I mean, it, it's one of the things that actually has kept me busy the last couple of days, to be honest, was I spent so much time wanting to personally respond to every single person that reached out to me in the business that has kept me busy, like going through them. Cause I've had so many emails and text messages that I haven't been trying to keep up with them. And, uh, that's amazing. I have a, you know, I said to my wife about this, you know, somebody like myself as a reporter, you write 
unfortunately, you have to write obituaries about uh, people when they die, you know, famous people in boxing, et cetera. I've written many of them over the years. And you always talk to different people about the person that you're writing about. And, and most of the time, they have very nice things today to say about them, nice memories, et cetera. And I thought to myself, as I'm reading all these nice comments from people, I felt like here I am very much alive, perfectly healthy, and, and reading like the comments that might appear in obituary of my own, even though I'm alive. It was a very bizarre feeling. It was nice to see those comments and hear those things and get the, all these people reach out to me. Um, I mean, that's, I guess, the silver lining. Has this situation left you with any kind of negative feeling towards boxing, Dan? Towards boxing? Absolutely not. No, my, my uh, excitement level and, and uh, enjoyment and passion for the sport is not altered whatsoever. This has nothing to do with the sport. This is, uh, you know, the, the mindset of, you know, one or two individuals at a company whose prerogative is to do what they did. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the sport of boxing. I, you know, that, that's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Have you got... I can't wait to get back to boxing. Yeah. Have you got a rough plan of kind of your immediate future, Dan? What you'll do? Uh, not really. You know, I'm going to have a nice dinner with my family tonight. That's about as far in the future as I'm thinking about. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, no, there, I, I haven't really thought about it because honestly, it might be different if the sport was up and running and we had a sport that was happening in a society that was functioning in a normal way. That would be different. But any place that I may look to go or any place that might show interest in me or my services, they're not going to worry about that at this moment because they got a lot of other things to worry about, a lot of other problems going on. If you're a, a media outlet or, or a broadcaster or whatever, you know, there are no sports going on. I think the last thing on their mind is, okay, how can we add another, you know, boxing person to our, to our crew? So that's, you know, I get that. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not to be presumptuous, but I would think that when things do you know, get back to whatever our new normal is going to be, that there are places out there that would uh, inquire about uh, something or interest. And, you know, I'd be appreciative of that. But at this moment, no, listen, and, uh, and you know what? One thing I can say about ESPN, whatever issues there may be with any company, I can never complain about what ESPN paid me. So, uh, you know, I'm perfectly content at this moment to sort of kick back, uh, ride out the, 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 the lockdown, you know, the stay at home orders and, you know, relax with my wife and son and, uh, and uh, thankfully don't have to, you know, be extremely concerned or worried about having to, you know, pay the mortgage bill or how we're going to have groceries or do with that kind of stuff. So I'm good, you know, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll use the time to sort of think a little bit about things. Dan, it's, it's crazy to think the situation we're in that we even got to see the Fury Wilder fight, which was less than two months ago, uh, which wasn't that long ago that we were in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, Seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It does seem like that, but it wasn't that long ago. But um, we saw the, the British Boxing Board of Control put a, a statement out today saying that they're hoping that boxing will in the UK will return um, early part of June, worst ways, the end of June. Um, I mean, I don't know, like I said, what's the situation regarding um, America for this, but when do you anticipate it coming back? Or is it, is it just too early to say at the moment? I just think it's too early to say, and I mean, you know, the, any, any of the, the bodies that make those decisions, as they have shown over the last couple of months, they'll say, we're going to extend the uh, no activity until this particular date, and then they assess the situation, and then they extend it further. And so if the British board, you know, has their reasons to think that perhaps boxing in the UK at least could resume sometime in, I guess, uh, late June, because I don't know, I did say late June, um, then then maybe it could, but I think that as time gets closer to that date, perhaps they'll realize that they're not ready to go, and at some point they'll probably just extend it again. I will say this, whatever it, the case may be, if it does resume in June, I have a very, very hard time believing that it would be done in, in the sense of a, a card where there were spectators. I just don't think that's possible. Now, if they can figure out a way to test properly and quickly and safely and all that and put people together uh, you know, in a lockdown situation for a few days to do an event, um, with no uh, audience and you know no real paying customer, so to speak. You know, I think that's possible. You know, they've talked about that in the United States in various capacities, not only for boxing, but uh, in UFC. You know, you, Major League Baseball people are trying to figure out a way to maybe bring you know the teams to one location in Arizona and play some semblance of a season. Same thing with uh, you know doing something to try to conclude the NBA season. Um, but you look, at it's it, who the heck knows? I'm not a, neither one of us are scientists or doctors. We don't have that expertise by any stretch. I mean, we can talk about heavyweights and bantamweights and all that, but when it comes to how to control this situation, you know, I just, uh, 
I'm at a loss, but I can say one thing for sure. You know, when it comes to a big fight, there's not, it's not going to exist because there's not going to be anybody that's going to, even if they say you can do it, you know, do you think that 20,000 people are going to show up at the O2 arena to sit in close proximity to all those people, even for a good fight? I just don't see it happening. And, and, and now, now multiply that by three, you know, or even more for the potential of a big Anthony Joshua fight. You think 70,000 people are going to turn out to the stadium in London to sit elbow to elbow to watch him fight Kubrat Pulev? Absolutely not, in my opinion. And that's too big of a fight to go on without a crowd. You know, some of the smaller fights, the promoters probably would be willing to eat the gate because it's not that much money in the scheme of their whole pie. In the scheme of a big fight, like a Joshua fight, where the gate's going to be probably close to, you know, nine or $10 million, you probably can't do an event without having that revenue stream. Mm. Everybody has their work cut out for them. We certainly do. Um, Don't you agree with that? I mean, do you think that's my crazy? Yeah, no, you, you make a good point because I think when we listen to kind of Eddie Hearn talk about the possibility of studio shows and um, crowdless shows, uh, those kind of fight nights seem that they could be manageable. But when yeah. you're talking about the, the likes of kind of the, the, the Tyson Furies and the Anthony Joshua's where big crowds are expected and it, it just doesn't seem feasible that even if, okay, we're out of this situation that that many people are going to come in a close proximity to being next to each other. Particularly, so, particularly that soon. We're only here now, you know, middle of April. Uh, it's, it's still not that far away. And keep in mind also, when they say that they can resume events, that means that the boxers have to be ready for the fight. So at some point, they're going to need, at least in my opinion anyway. Now, if you take your average fighter, hopefully they're staying in some kind of condition. I know it's hard because they can't go to the normal gym. They're probably not with their coach. They're not going to have sparring, that type of thing. You know, maybe they're you're able to run or you know do weights or whatever in the privacy of their home own, own home or you know take a run around the block. But I think every fighter, you know, it's only fair once things do return and you can put on an event, even with a you know first of all for a, for a significant fight, most guys want about eight weeks to train. That's probably out the window. Hopefully, they're keeping close to their to their conditioning presently. But I think it's only fair to give that 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 fighter, you know, man or woman, you know, at least a four week training camp. To, to get themselves in some kind of uh, conditioning for the fight, both and, and also the promoter so would probably like an opportunity to, tell, to promote the fight to let people know it's happening. Now, obviously, ticket sales may not be a part of that if they're in a closed situation, but still, you want to drum up some interest, get some press, you know, uh, put out some videos. Are probably not going to be like the, the normal kind of formal press conference or face to face type situation. So, they're going to have to get a little creative in how they promote the fight, let people know what's on. They're going to have to talk to uh, you know, their broadcasters. And in Eddie's case, obviously, he'll get with. Uh, uh, presumably the people at Sky and uh, certainly in America, the folks at the zone and try to hash out the schedule. So once they give the green light, it's still going to be probably a month to actually get something off the ground because mostly of the fact that these guys and gals have to get into the gym and be able to get themselves ready for a fight. And what did you make of um, the situation regarding the USC and Dana White? Obviously his original plans to uh, stage an event on an Island, etc., were kind of scuppered by uh, ESPN and Disney, but now, I mean, he's made some comments recently again about this fight island. You know, what, what's your take on it and how realistic is it for the UFC? Well, I think that what it was was he wants to do and still plans to do some events on this island. The, the event that, that there was pressure brought to bear by Disney uh, was an event that was supposed to take place. It wasn't one of the island fights. That was supposed to be a fight that they were going to do at a place called Tachi Palace, which is a casino on uh, Native American grounds. That's south. Of, it's like in central California, like south of the city of Fresno, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, and in the United States, uh, which is a common thing, there are the state commissions that oversee boxing. You know, like in Britain, you know, everything is regulated by the British board. In the United States, it's left up to each individual state commission. There's the California State Athletic Commission, the New York State Athletic Commission, and so on and so forth. However, in the United States, there are several uh, casinos that sit on Indian grounds that are sovereign to themselves, They're, they don't have to follow the State Athletic Commission. Some work in conjunction with them, but they can also go on their own. I'll give you an example. In New York, we have, there's the New York State Athletic Commission. They would be the ones that would oversee the big shows or any shows, frankly, at places like Madison Square Garden, the Barclays Center, you know, some of the smaller uh, clubs and that sort of stuff. But then up near, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the upstate area, there's, there's a casino called Turning Stone, which has hosted a number of significant. Yeah. They have their own tribal commission that does not have to 
uh, work with the New York Commission on their rules and regs. And in California, Tachi Palace falls into that same category where they're not regulated by the State Athletic Commission in California. So basically, UFC was going to try to do an end run because the folks at the Tachi Palace were willing to do the show. And so they were going to put this event on. Um, but because of everything that was going on, uh, Disney, which is the parent company of ESPN, uh, the chairman of that company uh, was contacted by the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, who's been, you know, if you're in the United States, he's on the news every night because California is uh, such a, a big part of this country, a big population where he's, you know, put in some serious rules about, you know, people going into groups and that sort of stuff. And basically, uh, you know, contacted Disney, which is based in California, and asked the chairman to intervene because ESPN, which is part of Disney, is the broadcast partner of uh, UFC and was supposed to do that event on pay-per-view. And the, the upshot of it was uh, the governor of California talked to the top person at Disney, who then went to uh, Dana White and said, look, stand down. Don't do this. It's not the right thing to do. And Dana, uh, you know, understood that. Like, I respect Dana for his attempt to try to create some normalcy and keep events going. But he's not stupid by any means. He's a smart guy. And, you know, when your broadcast partner tells you who's paying you, you know, literally a billion dollars for your, for your, uh, for your product, tells you, you know, we're going to sit this one out. We don't want to do this. What are you going to do? So he, he said, uh, you know, I'll respect. We won't do this one. And he wants to do these future fights on this island he supposedly has secured. And I guess we'll see how that pans out. Interesting to see how it does pan out. Dan, let me ask you about... Um these comments from Deontay Wilder he made on the PBC podcast, which I know you would have seen, um, stating that he doesn't see Tyson Fury as a, as a real champion until they've had their fight. Um, <laughs> Weren't we just at their fight and he got knocked out? <laughs> well, these were the, like I said, these were the comments he made on that podcast. No, no. And what did you make of that? And taking a little bit of the credit away from Tyson Fury, which Tyson Fury put a post on a BT Sport Instagram um, post that they'd put on yesterday uh, saying that, you know, look, that's boxing, you win some, you lose some, that kind of attitude. But what did you make of all that? I think that uh, Deontay is, uh, you know, Deontay's a good guy, but I think he's having a little bit of trouble uh, up here dealing with what happened. You know, he was undefeated and had dominated every one of his opponents for the most part, except for Tyson Fury. Even if you thought the first fight was a draw or that he won. It certainly wasn't the domination. And certainly there's a ton of people that thought that Tyson was the winner of that fight. And then to come into the second fight and get manhandled like that and just beat up and knocked out, uh, now you question yourself. And so I have yet to meet a fighter that has not looked for some type of rationale, excuse, whatever, when they've lost, uh, you know, even if it just sort of mentally psyched them up for the next fight. So, you know, I think that Deontay is trying to uh, find reasons why what happened happened. And and uh, is looking forward to that third fight. And, you know, people can say it's, you know, it's bad sportsmanship or he should just take his loss like a man, whatever. Some guys do that, but it seems rare. And, uh, you know, they have a they have, look, it, it, at the end, it's going to be all settled in the ring because they have an agreement for a third fight. It was part of the contract to do the two fight deal that they did post the first fight. So um, I thought that Tyson's response though was perfect. You know, he didn't, he didn't lash out. He didn't act like a jerk. And, and insult Wilder. He's like, look, dude, just take your loss and let's, you know, we'll do the third fight. I mean, I thought Tyson handled it really well. Uh, didn't love how Deontay handled it, but, you know, he's got to do what he's got to do to get himself in the mindset properly uh, for the next fight. So if he wants to try to fool himself that there was some kind of weird thing that happened and he just wasn't himself uh, and that was why he lost, then so be it. We'll, we'll find out in the third fight. And, you know, hopefully whatever occurs in that third fight, it's another conclusive result. And, uh, let everybody move on to whatever the next phase of their careers are. Hopefully the winner will be able to fight Joshua. Just coming on to that, a lot of talk gathering pace about the Joshua Fury fight. I mean, in order for that to happen this year, not just Deontay Wilder would have to step aside, but also Kubrat Pulev would have to step aside as well. Uh, that one seems more feasible, but it doesn't seem like Wilder will step aside to allow that fight to happen, surely. I don't think that, I don't, I, I think a few things about that. Number one, I don't, see Deontay stepping aside unless there's some radical change of heart. Um, you know, hearing Deontay's comments, having talked to his management, it, it just, that's, you know, that's just not who he is. He's going to go through with this third fight unless I said there's some dramatic radical change. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, you know, I know the Kubrat Pulev team pretty well. They're not stepping aside. 
you know, all, I mean, that's just, this is what they've worked for. This is what they uh, are owed. This is their position. They've waited a long time for this. You can, you can say whatever you want about Pulev's merit as the mandatory, however you want to look at it. He's a good quality heavyweight. He may not be the best heavyweight out there, but he's just as good of a challenger as any of these other guys in my mind. And uh, he deserves a shot and, and he's going to get it. They have a done deal. It's just a matter of it when, it, when they can reschedule the fight. And uh, again, I don't see them stepping aside. And even if uh, that fight happens and the, and the Wilder fight happens, look, you and I both know there will not be a, a, a Wilder Fury 3 winner versus Joshua, certainly not in 2020. That is at the window because I don't think either guy is stepping aside. And again, I don't think people are going to be ready to be in big, big crowds. You and I also know that that's such a huge fight that that would be wherever they put that fight, whether it's in you know, the United States or in Britain or a stadium or somewhere other exotic location, back to Saudi Arabia, wherever they would go, it'd be a packed house, maybe a full house for a fight like that. So, you know, you know I just think it's, it's an absolute waste of time to even think about that at the moment. It's, we want to see it, but we got to let the fights get back in the ring, number one, and then we got to let these guys go through with what they already have contractually obligated. Wilder Fury 3 is going to take place. AJ is going to have the fight against Pulev. Now, after that, there'll be a discussion. Will Usyk step aside? Obviously, Usyk still has to get through the Chisora fight, so we have to see what happens with that. You know, maybe Usyk might be amenable to step aside if they if they came up with the right kind of uh, number or the right kind of package. But you know, right now it's just sort of uh, there's so many things that would have to happen to make that a plausible fight for this year. It's just you know, there's a better chance of like you know. Uh, magic tricks coming true you know i just don't see it all right dan well um appreciate your time tonight dan and kind of uh giving us your uh your thoughts on those fights and also what's going on right <laughs> well we're all scratching the surface for boxing stories at the minute you know how it is so um hopefully like i said we can all come out of this with uh as less damage as possible and just get back to some kind of normality so um, agreed Dan, if you weren't so expensive, I'll try and sign you myself. But I know you'd, you'd be... I, I, I'm always willing to talk, you know. I've never been a person driven by the dollar or the pound. Dan, I know I can't afford you. Dan, I know <laughs> I can't afford you. But um, I yeah, love you anyway. Toby. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate your time. And uh, like I said, um, I'm sure we'll be catching up with each other at future events. And um, yeah, keep yourself safe, Dan, and your family. You Appreciate it. Coogan Cassius here with Dan Raphael for IFL TV. Thank you very much.